I'm Jason Wright, and this is the Texas Titans Podcast. Just like the name of the podcast suggests, I will be visiting with Texas Titans of business, academia, sports, or whatever their chosen field, looking for the disciplines and habits that have made these Texans so remarkable. Success leaves clues, and I want to crack the code to these Titans' success and share it with you. Thank you for joining me here on the Texas Titans Podcast. Last week, I had the distinct pleasure of sitting down with someone who in every way deserves the title of Texas Titan. Kevin L. Tyf is the new chairman of the University of Texas System Board of Regents. However, the road to this position is filled with success in both business as well as public service. Here is his official bio. Kevin P. L. Tyf is from Tyler, Texas, and was appointed to a six-year term on the University of Texas System Board of Regents by Governor Greg Abbott in January 2017 and was confirmed by the Texas Senate in February 7th of 2017. On December 20th, 2018, he was elected chairman of the Board of Regents. Chairman L. Tyf chairs the System Review and Structure Task Force. He previously served on the Academic Affairs Committee, the Audit, Compliance, and Risk Management Committee the Facilities Planning and Construction Committee, the Finance and Planning Committee, and the Board for the Lease of University Lands. He formerly served as Senator for Texas Senate District 1, as the Mayor of Tyler, and on the Tyler City Council. He has also served as a member of the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Mr. Eltoff is the owner of Eltoff Properties Limited. He is a director for Citizens First Bank and serves on the University of Texas at Austin Development Board and the University of Texas at Tyler Development Board. Mr. Eltoff earned a Bachelor of Business Administration from the University of Texas at Austin. He resides in Tyler with his wife and two children. I personally consider Kevin a friend and a mentor. It was such a pleasure sitting down with him and learning more about what can only be described as a life well lived. I hope you enjoy this episode of Texas Titans Podcast with my friend, Kevin Eltoff. This episode of the Texas Titans podcast is brought to you by Hot Tots, H-A-U-T-E-T-O-T-Z, Hot Tots in La Piazza Shopping Center on Old Bullard Road in Tyler, Texas. At Hot Tots, they have such wonderful brands as Tea Collection, Buford Bonnet, and many others. They have an incredible toy section, which features Melissa and Doug, Lego, and coming shortly, Nerf. So, If you need toys, if you need baby gifts, if you're expecting, whatever you need for your newborn through preteens, Hot Tots is the place for you. You can visit Hot Tots online at hottots.com where you can shop online or you can stop by at 4855 Old Bullard Road, Suite 103, right behind Broadway Square Mall. Hot Tots is the absolute most incredible place for your newborn, your preteen, and anything in between. Please visit Hot Tots, one of my favorite sponsors ever. All right, so I am here with my dear friend, and 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 look, I may have to say this before almost every one of my first podcasts, because most of my guests are mentors in some form or fashion, and if ever there was anybody that fits that bill, it's you, Kevin. I mean, you've been a mentor of mine, so, and let me just kind of do a little rundown here, you know. Kevin L. this is your life. (laughs) We're talking about- scary. Uh, real estate investor, very successful, uh, former city councilman in the city of Tyler, former mayor, city of Tyler, former state senator, and well-respected. As a matter of fact, I used to say, if there's a bill that is working its way through the Capitol in Austin, if you've got Kevin L. type support on it, then you get to start at the head of everybody else. I mean, look, you did. I don't I mean, know about that. Well, you had the You're respect of your colleagues. And then now, your most recent role, you are now the new chairman of the University of Texas uh, Regents. And so, what I like to do is just, first of all, let's go back to your Tyler native, East Texas native. Kind of tell me about Kevin L. Tyth leaves Robert E. Lee High. Yes, right? Robert E. Okay. High School. Robert E. Lee High School, heads to the University of Texas. 
Did you know at that point what you wanted to do? And whenever you were an undergrad, did you, was it real estate? Was it politics? Kind of take me back to that, that Kevin. Well, I have to give full disclosure. I actually went to SMU first. Did yeah, you know? I, I, I did, did not know that. A lot of people don't know that. But actually, uh, my high school class, mm-hmm. I graduated high school in 77, and my a lot of my classmates were going to Tech, Texas okay. Tech. Right. And I, I went out to Tech, looked at it, and it was so far from home that I was scared to go to Tech <laughs> without all of them. Well, so, in Tech, you can watch your dog run away for three days. <laughs> well, that's you know? right. It's crazy. I mean... I love the school, but I, I got nervous about being so far from home. So at the last minute, I picked uh, SMU. Okay. So I went to SMU my freshman year. Uh, after my uh, first semester, I kind of got the feeling it wasn't the right fit for me. And I had friends at Texas, so I started going to Austin on the weekends and uh, immediately fell in love with the University of Texas at Austin. Okay. So I, after not doing very well, Academically, my freshman my freshman semester, my spring semester, I made up the grades to get into UT Austin, and I transferred. So my sophomore year, I entered University of Texas at Austin, okay. and uh, I pledged fraternity. I pledged SAE, okay. uh, Sigma Alpha Epsilon, at University of Texas at Austin, and you know I had I just I mean probably some of the funnest years of my life were mm-hmm. at UT Austin. I mean right. I, I I love the school. I I uh, got a degree in business management petroleum land management in the business school and uh, made made friends that I have to this day quite frankly uh, when I was there right and so graduated from UT Austin in I think it was December of 82 okay I stayed an extra semester yeah should have wow. stayed extra year yeah. but <laughs> right right but stayed extra semester and um, got out and went to work in Houston for my uncle he had a he was a employment agency. He was a headhunter, actually. Okay. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no clue. Right. You know, but he was. I was very close to him. As uh, you know, Jason, a lot of people know, my father died when I was a year and a half old. Yep. My mother never remarried. She raised uh, me and my brother and my sister, uh, basically, on Social Security and Veterans Benefits. And this uncle lived next door, and I was very close to him. Mm-hmm. He was kind of like a father to me. So he said, come work for me. So I went to Houston and lived in Houston for... I think two and a half, three years, and worked for him, and uh, then decided I wanted to uh, kind of back to East Texas. I knew I was going to get married. I was dating Kelly, my my wife, mm-hmm. uh, now my wife, and I thought if I'm going to get married, I probably want to move back to Tyler, East Texas. So I bought a business in Longview and moved back to Longview. What and was that business? I had a. It was a Texaco distributorship. Okay, I was a. I actually was looking for business to buy in Tyler. Yeah, and a friend of mine. Chris Abraham's father had a Texaco distributorship. Okay. I was thinking about selling, so I came and visited with him, and he decided I don't want to sell, but the guy in Longview wants to sell. Okay. So he sent me to see Joe Russo, who was a great guy, older guy, wanted to retire, and he um, we met off and on. I didn't have any money. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> I had no money, and but he we kind of hit it off. Right. And so funny, he I think Joe at the time was in his seventies, and his college roommate was Lebanese, and okay. I'm Lebanese. Okay. So he had this bond with his college roommate from years back, mm-hmm. and so he just kind of, I don't know why, he kind of took to me because I was Lebanese, and I was, I was determined to do this deal. Yeah. Know? And so he owner financed some. I got some bank, I got a bank loan for a second lien. I mean, I wired that deal together, and I bought the Texaco distributorship in Longview. Wow. And lived there for, I think I ran it for, Two years, two or three years, and I added a couple convenience stores. And yep. those, that's the old days. Mm-hmm. I don't know that they're, they do it the same way anymore, but they were jobbers, Texaco jobbers. Yep. And you delivered gas to the, to the service stations that were branded Texaco. And we sold oil to like Texas Eastman. So I kind of took it, cleaned it up, uh, leaned it up, got rid, cut some expenses, added volume to the business. And like two or three years later, I sold it. Okay. For a nice profit. That was where I first made my first deal. Right. My first. How old are you at this point? You know, I would have been um, 25. Okay. And I think, because I was 27 when I got married, and, and um, so it was about the 25 to 28 range, somewhere in there. Okay. Because um, when we first got married, we lived in Longview. So I stayed in Longview for, with that for two or three years. And then after I sold out, we moved back to Tyler, and I decided I wanted to build a cleaners, a dry cleaning business. And there was a cleaners when I went to school in Austin called Homesteam. 
And I, <laughs> I don't know why, but I always remember we, we would drive over there because they had like, I don't know, 59 cent shirt day or something. Right. And they had a drive through. And it was weird because the plant where you clean the clothes was in the back and the uh, behind the clothes was in the front. They had a you know, drive through, which was rare for dry mm-hmm. cleaners. Mm-hmm. So I always, I always remembered that and thought that was a good idea. So I came back to Tyler and I built a cleaners with a drive through, Regency cleaners. Mm-hmm. So I took my profit from Longview, built the cleaners, ran it, ground up, never been in the cleaning business. I remember the first day I opened the, the uh, cleaning machine, it was, it was the, I forget the kind of cleaning fluid, but I bought all used equipment to save money. Did, yeah. Never ran it, any of this equipment in my life. And right. the first day I opened the machine overflows and there's <laughs> Napa, whatever that cleaning fluid was. It was all over the, it was a disaster. Right. And, uh, but we got it running and people loved it. I hired a, a guy named Darnell Johnson, who a lot of people in Tyler know. He passed away about a year ago. Good, fr- good friend of mine. Hired Darnell. He was he was my delivery man, and everybody loved Darnell. Mm-hmm. So we were kind of a team, and uh, we built a heck of a business. And I kept that and sold it maybe five years later. And really, at that point, is when I kind of got. At the same time, I was buying real estate. Okay. So I bought the real estate. I bought the real estate. Put the cleaners on, and I sold the cleaning business, but kept the real estate and became a landlord. And then I built Regency Texco behind it. And from then on, I just really became more of a landlord developer than right. Tyler. That's okay. what kind of got me started. So it's, it's kind of cool because I don't know if you and I have ever really talked about it, but that's very similar to how I ended up in Tyler. So I'm in Houston, and I'm traveling all the time. Rylan and Abby are two and three years old, and I start looking for businesses to buy. And like you, don't come from money, didn't have any money, but I knew I wanted to buy a business. And... You know, guys like us, we're kind of like, if I find the business and I find the deal, I'll figure out the capital. You know, that's kind of right. last week. It's like, right. if it's a good enough idea, I'll find out. And so, very similar situation. Uh, I come to Tyler. I find out that Jim Daughtry, who his dad, J.O. Daughtry, had started Daughtry Realty like 56 years ago. Right. J.O. at the time, I think, was 83. Jim was almost 60. And Jim did not want to run the business by himself forever. He was kind of ready to get ready for his exit plan. and. Called him up one day. Uh, a friend of mine said, hey, there's a real estate company maybe you can buy. And you'll love how I put this deal together. Uh, so I call him. I say, hey, will you sell your company? Would you be interested in selling your company? He says, yeah, I might. I said, okay. So I come down. I look at it. And he wants to sell his building on the loop with the, the franchise. It was Century 21 franchise. And I go, okay. And so we're talking through this deal. And the whole time, I'm still going I don't know how I'm going to buy this, you know, but I'm at, I'm talking to him like I've got the the means and the ability, right. and and for some reason he believes me, you know. And you were 25, I was 28 at this time. That's funny. And so I'm driving down the road in Houston, and do you remember those Carlton Sheets real yes. estate? Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. So I'm listening to a Carlton Sheets buy real estate with no money down tape. <laughs> And I'm listening to it, and he talks about how you can get sellers to take a second lien, and they can do owner financing. The bank will take the first. And I'm like, I wonder if Jim Daughtry would do that because what I had learned through our negotiation was that he only owed fifty six thousand on this building that he thought was worth like four hundred grand. And so I'm like, huh? I call my bank up, and I'm like, hey. Would you give me a two hundred thousand dollar loan on a building that I think's worth four hundred? They owe fifty six on it, and of course, any like any bankers like, well, yeah, we'll yeah. do that deal. But understand, we're going to take first position. The seller's going to take the second, right. and you're probably not going to get the seller to do that. That's how I bought my first company, Kevin. I I went to That's Jim awesome. and I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a loan for $200,000. I'm going to pay off your note. I'm going to give you a down payment. I'm going to keep the difference for my working capital. And he said, you're crazy. There's no way I can do that. He said, that <laughs> building, that's, that's my mom and dad's retirement. And that's how, I, and, but after about three months, he called me up and he said, fine, I'll do the deal the way you want to do it. And so I went down to Landmark Title. I closed on the deal, walked out with a $90,000 check that I put in the bank as my working capital. Same deal. It's how I bought my first company. It's exactly the same. Yeah. And so, all right, so tell me, because this is one of the things I think that uh, listeners need to understand. When you buy that first company, it's almost like, I think everyone thinks that, well, I'm I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business owner, so I don't know about you, but I was scared to death. I walked in, I'm like, 
I was yeah. scared to I was scared to leave the building to go buy office supplies because I'm like, is everything going to be okay yes. while I'm gone? So yes, take me all the way back to the distribution company. You've closed. Now you're the owner. Same deal with me. There was owner financing, bank financing. So the owner's still there. So you still got your seller kind of close by, yes. but, but yes. you're the guy. You're in charge. That's right. So. Take me, try to remember back and tell me what those first few days were like. How did you figure out, okay, here's what I'm going to do first. And did you get it right? Or did you, I know I screwed up a lot of things. I don't know about you, but I screwed up some stuff. Tell me what it was like those first few days of being a business owner. Well, you're absolutely right. It was, I was scared to death. And Joe Russo, who I bought the business from, mm-hmm. did, he came in. He still was coming in for half a day and helping me, but I had no clue what I was doing. I mean, this is a gas, this is a gasoline <laughs> right. distributorship with these huge tanks. Yeah, we had eight, you know we had a eighteen wheeler that we filled up with gas. Mm-hmm. We had a bobtail that we told twenty five hundred gallons, and they were going to teach me how to drive the, right. the bobtail right. so right. I could right. deliver gas. Right. I wanted to know how to do it all. Yeah. I refused to learn to drive the eighteen wheeler because I knew I'd kill everybody <laughs> in, in in front of me. Right. But I did learn to drive the bobtail. But I I agree it. it and you just have to dive in. Yeah. And luckily, he had some good employees mm-hmm. um, that helped me a ton. And, you know, we gradually modernized it and got, you know, new computer software and mm-hmm. just the things he had never done. Yeah. And, you know, so it, but it was, it was very scary. And it was, you know. So, yeah. I, right now I do a lot of, uh, I'm trying to do some mentoring with some undergrads at SFA, some at UT Tyler. And, you know, it's, it's, everyone has this romantic vision of, I want to own my own business. Either they've got an idea, they want to start a business, they want to buy a business, right. but they want to be in business for themselves. Having been there and done that from those early days to where you are now, I mean, you go from, from 25 years old to 60 years old. Right. What advice would you give a, a, a young person, or for that matter, someone that's 55 and has just recently retired from their corporate gig, and now they're about to go buy their first small business, what would you say are, okay, step one, do this, step two, do this, kind of walk me through, now knowing what you do, having had those experiences, you would advise somebody buying their first business? Well, you know, I mean, I've always, I'm always looking for upside in anything I do, and I, and I also want an exit strategy. So, I mean, I've always, when I looked at that first, when I looked at his business, you know, he had a lot of waste and, mm-hmm. and expenses. He And he even acknowledged that. he I think he had um, a son-in-law, and he, he had a couple employees mm-hmm. that really didn't have to be on the payroll, but he was helping them out. And he knew that. Um, and, and there was a lot of, there's quite a bit of waste there. Mm-hmm. So I knew, you know, even if I made mistakes after I bought it, there was some, I had some room mm-hmm. to play with with uh, cutting costs and making more money to make sure I could cover my notes. Because like you, I had a first lien, a second lien, and some owner financing. I had a, a bunch of notes to pay. Right. But and I also knew there were other people that wanted to buy that business. I mean, mm-hmm. it was you know he he could have sold it to some competitors, and so mm-hmm. I knew if I needed out, I could get out. Okay. But I also knew going in there was upside, and right. that's kind of been my philosophy with real estate as well. I mean, same same thing. You know, I don't just go out and most of the stuff I've bought is not already a fully leased building. It's usually something empty that I can clean up, fix up, lease up, mm-hmm. and exit if I need to. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that's the most important thing is, you know, you need to make sure there's upside and you need to make sure there's an exit strategy. I think that's the most important thing. Mm-hmm. I think some people go in and they think, well, if they, as long as they get the loan and can buy it, they're done. Yeah. And, you know, you can overpay. I mean... It's old saying, you make your money when you buy, not when you sell. Yep. I mean, everybody knows that saying, and it's true. Yeah. If you overpay, you're, you're really in a bad position. Right. So, and, and I feel, you know, I also have to say, this is pretty obvious, it, things were so much easier to do back then. It was, mm-hmm. it was so much easier to transact yeah. business with the bank, and they were the, the, the loan process. Back then, it was on a lot of it. If they trusted you and liked you and, you know, you know, if you presented a good plan, they thought this kid's going to be successful. They would take a little risk with a young guy buying right. something, and now the regulations don't allow for a lot of that. That's right. It's a whole different animal, and so it's a lot harder today to do what me and you did. Absolutely. In fact, even though I was, you know, further back than you, still it was, it's harder to do now. Oh, I agree. I mean, I've told people that I don't think I would be able to do those first few years like I did because. I never sold a house in my life. I'm buying a real estate company, and it was the same thing. It's like 
so much of the 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 well the owner you know who lent me the money the bank they knew who I was and uh, now you're right it's it's really it, I don't know that I could that was 16 years ago I right. don't know if you could do it six you know I don't know if you could do that today I agree which is really a shame uh, because that to me that is kind of that whole the the American spirit of entrepreneurship yes. and, they, and anything we can do to make that easier I think is is good for 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 business but uh, so I agree with you so. All right, so you you exit that. You're in the, the cleaning business. Now, the thing about the cleaning business that has always scared me to death, one, like you said, I don't want to deal with the EPA ever. There's, right. there's, there's right. chemicals there that can make people go blind and probably stunt their growth and make them grow three heads. And I, right. I don't want to deal with that. Um, but secondly, you've got a lot of employees. So uh, tell me about Kevin L. Tyth back then as a business operator. Uh, hiring, firing, yeah. and developing people. What yeah. does that look like, and how did was that trial and error? Do you have a <laughs> philosophy on how to do that? Well, I can tell you this: that all these years later, I have no employees now, so that kind of tells you. In which, which, by the way, so the listeners <laughs> cannot can't see this, but I got to tell everyone here: I want to be Kevin L. Top when I grow up because <laughs> if and the business owners will respect this. Literally, we are sitting in his. Azalea District antique home that he's converted into a gorgeous office where it's only Kevin. When I it's leave, nice <laughs> it will just be him. There's no employees. It's no employees. fantastic. And you know what? I noticed that the mailbox always works. <laughs> That's the most important thing. The exactly right. checks will always fit into the mailbox. You gotta have a mailbox. So, so anyway, <laughs> no, I'm telling you, Kevin, I drive by this place all the time. And for those of you who are listening, don't even try to find it. I'm not gonna tell you where it is. And that's all by design, I think. <laughs> um, and uh, you will not find Kevin L. Tyson's office, which I well, think is. I, you know, I, I actually enjoyed having employees, but it's so hard. I mean, it's, yeah. and, I, and I'm not. You know, I was too nice a boss. I mean, you know, in the, yeah. you imagine the dry cleaning business. I think I had twenty five or thirty employees um, in different shifts. I think because it, that the cleaners really grew to be one of the bigger cleaners in Tyler, and we had you know, so we had quite a few employees. But you know, they're always needing help, which I would always help them. Wanted to help them, you know. Um, so pay for funerals, pay for yeah, you know, bail money to get out of jail at two yeah. in the morning. You know, I, I I would always take care of my my good employees. I wanted to help them. But that's hard. I mean, it's, empl having employees is very difficult, and that was the hardest part back then. And so, over the years, as I've grown the real estate part of it, where I just do more landlord developer or whatever, you know, once I buy a property, I have a Burns Commercial Properties manages everything mm -hmm. for me. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're just an independent property management company, and they manage it. They collect the rents, take care of the right. maintenance, and. So it's so I really don't have any employees anymore. But um, I enjoyed having employees in the day, but that it's work. That, yeah, that's hard. It's hard. It is, and you know that's another thing too that I you know I think it's it's important to convey to anyone who thinks they want to be in, in business for themselves and be the boss. Uh, you know, I'm like you. Yeah, I've made house payments when I could barely make my own. Right. Because you you have that you you have that internal conversation that says well. I need that person to perform yes. in order to make my ends meet. Right. And so and my, I was kind of the same way. I don't care how bad the employee was. I was way too slow to fire, probably sometimes too yeah. quick to hire. And yeah. you need to reverse that, right? It's, you right. be quick to fire if they, if they deserve it. No end. And you do. You know when. You may not want to admit it. Uh, and be slower to hire because good people are, I mean, your human capital is, yeah, that's is, right. is the essence of any good business. That's exactly right. Um, okay, so you exit the dry cleaners. Now you're in real estate. What what are you buying? Are you buying, Well, or did you do something else? Well, no. Actually, that's, I mean, what happened was I, I knew I wanted to be in real estate. Okay. All along, that was, that was my goal. Yeah. And um, because I grew up with my, my uncles that, that kind of, took me under the wing when I was a kid and my father died. They were both they were both in real estate. So yeah. I would drive around when I was the summer I would drive my uncle around and collect rent. So I mean mm -hmm. that, he taught me how to use the amortization table. He had a that blue book in his I'll never forget it in his glove box. Most people don't even know what a glove box is. That's a console <laughs> in the car. <laughs> but but um, I mean so we'd go figure he'd go look at a property to buy he was in residential and he'd go, all right now look up if I borrow ten thousand, what is it monthly payment? What can we rent it for? 
So I mean, I grew up on all that. So I knew I wanted to do, I knew I wanted to do the real estate thing. So, you know, on the cleaners, when I sold the cleaners, I kept the building. Okay. So I sold it to uh, Tom Dupin. I owner financed it, and I kept the building. So I became his landlord. And then I developed this. The good Lord blessed me in the perfect time. to be in real to get into real estate because it was FDIC RTC days. That was the 1980s crash mm-hmm. in Texas where, you know, in Tyler everything just went through the floor. I mean, we had empty strip centers, and that's how I bought the land. The cleaners was on from I think it was the defunct first city, if I'm not mistaken. And um, so they had the, they had a shopping center around the cleaners, and they had a, a piece of land behind the cleaners on Broadway. So I just kept buying pieces from the same bank, mm-hmm. and I bought the I built a convenience store Texaco behind the cleaners and as a landlord I didn't operate it I built it and had put a tenant in there and then I bought the strip center next to the cleaners uh, Regency Center um, it was empty from First City so back then you know I was buying everything I could buy that I could afford to buy right of course the bottom had fallen out and everybody around me was saying you're crazy you know this thing's never going to come back for a long time, but I didn't have that much anyway. So I felt like, <laughs> what have I got to lose here? Yeah. You know, so, and that's really how I started. Okay. Um, and, and things back in Tyler turned around fast, mm-hmm. relatively speaking from those days, you know, I bought, I bought that strip center. I bought, um, the Regents bank building downtown. It was, it was kind of all messed up because mm-hmm. of the, uh, the bank had gone under and I bought the old, I'll never forget where KLTV is downtown. That was an old bank building full of, that was the old Tyler Bank and Trust. It was full of asbestos, and it was on a ground lease the Swan Zone. Mm-hmm. And the RTC or FDIC1 had the ground, had the building, surface rights, and they were still paying a ground lease. So I went and got, the RTC actually paid me like 150000 to take the building. And then I went and took the money and bought the ground lease out from the swans so i ended up getting in the building for like nothing but it was full of asbestos so i mean there was more to the story but i spent a lot of money and put kltv in there at ubs made a nice little building out of it and sold it so but that's kind of stuff i used to do is yeah you know look for messed up deals right you know if it's sitting out there with a for sale sign on it's probably not that great a deal right oh yeah all right so now uh, this kind of your now, legend has it, and this is great because I have never confirmed this story with you directly, <laughs> and if, if the true story is not as good as my story, then I'm going to ignore it because I have so much fun bragging story, about right? you on this story. So, legend has it that the way Kevin L. Tyfe enters public service is not because he is some ideologue, he's... He's, I mean, he's got his constitution in one hand, his American flag in one hand, and a bayonet in his mouth, and he's ready to charge you. <laughs> but you're trying to do a development. You're trying to connect. The Texaco, uh, actually. You're, you're trying to, and, and if I'm not mistaken, right. it's connecting Old Bullard with Broadway and it's Chimney Rock. Yeah, okay. it's actually the sidewalk in front of that Texaco is what it was. Okay, yeah. so, so what I understand is you're trying to get that deal done. Yeah. And the city's just giving you hell. Yeah. They won't. And so you finally just say, to hell with this. Yeah. I'm running for city council because this doesn't make sense. So it's true. Walk me through that. Is, is, that, is, the, is the legend true? It's true. I okay. Mean, it, it, it's, I mean, it's kind of crazy. I, I really had no aspiration for, I wasn't trying to run for office or be in politics. It wasn't even on my mind. It was real estate was on my mind. And I sold the cleaners and I was building the Regency Texaco, which faces Broadway. Mm-hmm. And as you can imagine, your, your sidewalks have to be a certain. You know, sidewalks have to be level. Yep. And um, coming off Broadway, the driveway dips. And I did not, I wanted to dip the sidewalk with the driveway so you have a smooth exit coming off of Broadway so you don't bottom out. You Makes know? sense. I, that, I thought it made sense. I'm not an engineer. I'm not an architect. I'm not, well, this is just common sense. So I went down to the city and the guys, the engineer told me, he said, no, you can't, you can't we're not going to give you a variance. The sidewalk has to stay the same level. And I said, well, this just doesn't make any sense. I'm not, it doesn't make, and he just, I think what made me mad was, it wasn't that he told me no, it was how he told me. I mean, they were very difficult to deal with, and they weren't appreciative of the fact I was de- constructing a piece of property that was going to pay property tax to the city. And I just left there pissed off. Mm-hmm. And it, Tyler has, uh, as you know, because you're on city council, has single-member districts, 
and uh, Les Ratliff was my councilman, and we have term limits. Mm -hmm. So he was term limited. We were right in the middle of filing period in the spring or whenever. So I drove over to Mr. Ratliff's house, and I said, I'm going to run for your seat. You can't run anymore. Are you okay with that? You know, kiss the ring. Oh, yeah. And he was like, I'm impressed you came by here. I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell my mother. I filed, and the next day it was on the front page of the paper. And my mother thought it was my obituary. She, she, had, she calls up the paper, and she sees, you know, she's like, what in the hell is he going yeah. on? Yeah. Anyway, I, I ran. I filed, and I ran, and um, won, and served three years on the city council. But that is why I got involved. And my mission after I got on the city council was we're going to make this place customer friendly. Yeah. You work for the citizens of Tyler, and if someone walks in that door, you treat them like a customer. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we had a good run at that. And how old were you at this point? You know, I'm going to guess this age. I think probably 32. I think okay. that's about right. Because okay. uh, I think I was uh, 36, 37 when I became mayor. So that's maybe 31, 32. Okay. Something like that. Okay. So now you're on, you're on council. And tell me what that's like. And by the way, you know, because I know... It, you're, you are a very humble guy. You won't brag on yourself. But the story that I always tell about the city of Tyler is that one of the lowest, if not the lowest, tax rate of any city our size in the state, no general obligation debt. Whenever you see a road extension, any, any form of infrastructure improvement, uh, it's paid for with cash. Just a very, it's kind of just a very well-run uh, municipality. And in fact, there are fewer employees at the city of Tyler today than there were, you know, 20 years ago. I mean, right. it's just a very lean and efficient, uh, and efficiently run municipality. And a lot of that stems from what was the Tyler blueprint, right. which happened under your tenure. So talk to me about, you know, devising the Tyler blueprint, kind of what it was, how you conceived of it and, and some of the benefits that you have seen as a citizen and, and you know, Talk about what how your plan has yielded dividends to the city. Well, it, first of all, it was a team effort. I mean, it, yeah. But what I got on the council, and you know, my attitude of any tax dollars was I want to spend it like I spend my own. And those were the days when you know if something broke, if a sprinkler broke or something on one of my properties, I went and fixed it. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't have the luxury of just you know calling people. I, I, I did a lot of the stuff myself. And so, and like I said back in our earlier conversation. You know, when I bought the Texco and ran the cleaners, I was looking for efficiencies because it's my money. Mm -hmm. So when I got on the council, it was the same approach. How can we run the place uh, more efficiently, mm -hmm. more customer friendly? So I served on the council. I kind of learned my way around and, um, you know, toward, I guess I was in my fifth year on the fourth or fifth year on the city council. You're term limited after six, after three two-year terms. And the, the state offered the sales tax uh, uh, cities and counties could have elections to raise sales tax for various things. Some cities and counties already used it. You could pass it for economic development, where it all went to an economic development mm -hmm. council. The economic development council had the vote and lost for it to go to the Tyler Economic Development Council. So the option was still available to the city of Tyler. So we put. I worked with Pinkney Butler, who was the chief mm -hmm. financial officer at the time. He later became, when I became mayor, he became city manager. We put together a plan and said, all right, why don't we raise the sales tax in Tyler? Why don't we have an election? And we'll promise the voters, give us the half-cent sales tax. Let us raise sales tax in Tyler half a percent. And we're going to take that money, and we're only going to pay cash for improvements. In most cities, what you have to do is every five to seven years is have a bond election. You borrow money, you build parks, roads, streets, drainage, airports, and that is paid for by property taxes. There's a debt service on the property tax rate. So we said, we're, why don't we stop this cycle of bond elections? Why don't we dedicate this to improvements, to replace bond issues? So we go to voters, we say, look, we'll pass half-cent sales tax. We'll only pay cash for improvements. We'll lower the property tax rate because we'll lose our, our debt service rate. And we'll also put the blueprint in place and start streamlining city government. We'll do all this if you give us half-cent sales tax. Of course, everybody comes after me because I was on the council leading the charge for this and kind of the spokesman when we had the campaign. And it was tax and spend LTIF, you know. You're just a liberal. We're going to give you more money. You'll never cut our taxes, which I, I understand. I mean, nobody trusts elected officials with money. But we did get the – we got it passed. And so after we passed it, the mayor's election was up next, the next spring. And so I ran for mayor because everybody said, all right, if you're going to, if we're going to take our money, you better run for mayor and keep your promise. So ran for mayor, won, imp then we started implementing it. 
And I think when we started, the tax rate was 54 cents. And I think when I left office, it was 24 cents. We completely eliminated GO bond debt, uh, which that's what helped reduce the tax rate because you no longer have to pay for it with property taxes. And we pay cash for improvements. So now when you drive around Tyler, you sell the sign and say, paid for in cash by the half cent sales tax. So it was a model for the city of Tyler. And that, that wasn't me, that was a team effort for the council. And council since then, you, mayor since then, everyone has really rallied around that. And we are a model city if, if you uh, look at what's going on. I mean, we still have a tax rate in the 20 cent range, I believe. Yeah, 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 no, it is. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I would actually get calls, and I know that, you know, Mayor Hines has had these calls too, you know, from other municipalities. Yes. Just tell us, how do you do it in Tyler? How, how does that work? And I think it all goes back to that, but you, you did say one key thing there that it's, it's a shame that, that this can't be at the federal level yes. and, and in fact the yes. state level. I mean, you said, we're going to take this money and yes. this is what it's going to be used for. And it has always, I mean, I'm telling you, and, and for the listeners, you know, having served on city council, they don't vary. I mean, right. that those dollars are appropriate. In fact, I mean, there was a lot of hand-wringing and twisting and turning just to be able to use half-cent sales tax dollars for for uh, asphalt yes. a, because it's yes. not a permanent piece of infrastructure, right? Yes. It's, it's more of a repair. So, uh, so I commend you for that and your time there. Now, so you're, you're, you run for mayor, then all of a sudden you get the bright idea to become a state senator. Well, how does that happen? That, well, I, honestly, I, mean, I know that nobody believes it. I mean, Gecko, are there, that, how many yachts can you can That you was another behind? accident. It, all right. it really was. So I, I ran, I was councilman for five years, okay. mayor for six, term limited out, finished as mayor, and Bill Ratliff was our state senator. And um, he, I think I was out of office as mayor maybe a year, and Bill uh, resigned. He didn't, he, there was, there was a big redistricting fight at the time, actually, and, and he resigned. He'd had enough. And so Ratliff resigns, and he calls me, and he says, all right, Elsaf, I'm, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to resign, and there's going to be a special election. You ought to consider running. Mm -hmm. And so I was, you know, I, I thought, you know, I don't know where I said, okay, I'm going to do this. And I, honest to goodness, it's the truth. Had it just been an open seat in a normal cycle, I'm not sure I would have done it. It was just kind of like one of those things you know, here's a special election. You bet, if you ever want to do it, you better do it now. Mm -hmm. So I ran, and there were five, I think there were five of us in the race, and you don't, in a special, you're all on the ballot together, Democrats, Republicans, is there's no primary. Right. So there were five of us, and then me and Paul Sadler ended up in the runoff, and then I beat Paul in the runoff. And so went to the Texas Senate, and I think I served um, 12 or 13 years in the Texas Senate. Okay. Now, and along along the ways, and you're you're exhibiting as you go leadership at every turn. So, I would like the Kevin Altai philosophy on on leadership, where you're amongst a bunch of supposed leaders. I mean, look, if you become an elected yeah. official, especially if you're in the the Texas Senate, which is very much like the United States Senate, very collegial. There's a certain you know sport, there's a certain etiquette that's expected. Right. So. As you, you've, got, you've taken your business skills and applied those, but now what is your strategy and what advice would you give any leader as far as, all right, if you want to get things done, you have to, if you're going to lead, you've got to have followers. How did you figure out how to do that? Because, again, you, know, uh, you had the reputation of someone <coughs> both sides of the aisle. Yeah. They, they may not agree with you. Uh, and, and it might be the Republicans didn't agree with you as well, or Democrats, but they respected you enough, you always got that attention to at least get your argument heard. Um, how did you do that? What was your philosophy? Well, you know, I, I think um, you have to treat everybody with respect, and you have to build relationships. And you need to earn, you know, you need to earn your way and your trust with fellow members, no matter where you are. I mean, you can't just jump in there and all of a sudden start raising hell that I'm for this, and, you know, I'm it's my way or no way. I mean, you know... I got to the Senate and I started by, you know, building relationships, learning people, learning what people's issues were, kind of get to know what their districts are about. Of course, I knew what I wanted to do for my district. I always, you know, uh, represented my district. But also, the first thing I did was I walked in the Senate lounge, just give you a flavor for, I think, how you kind of uh, get people to like you. I walked in the Senate lounge and they had these two... TVs that looked like they had rabbit ears. I mean, it was just like, they, I don't know how they were watching these TVs. 
and this, it was just horrible. And so I said, I asked the dean of the Senate, John Whitmire, who now is one of my best friends. The dean of the Senate is the longest serving member in the Senate, yeah, and he's he was a Democrat. I, I asked him, I said, Dean Whitmire, what? <laughs> When's the last time y'all remodeled the Senate lounge? The Senate lounge is behind the chamber. Only senators can go in there so we have lunch and watch. You can watch the House or TV or whatever. And he goes, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what the hell. Just what were you talking about? I said, well, Can I remodel the lounge? You know, that's what I'm asking. He goes, Yeah, do it. So I got two big flat screens, put new furniture in there. You know, it's instant, mm -hmm. instant success. And and then you know, I started having dinners with senator. I would host dinners with senators. I was kind of the social chairman. Okay. in my freshman years and that's how they got to know me and so you know and I, I just had I would go out of my way to show respect for other members mm -hmm. and help them when I could you know I wouldn't vote for stuff just to uh, that I was against um, but if I can help another member with an issue at a, or lay out a bill for them in hearing while they're doing something else so you just build relationships mm -hmm. and that, I mean that's really how you do it and after and build relationships with the house the state house the house of representatives and you know over time about midway through my 12 years, you know, everybody said, you can trust Eltif. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got a problem, go talk to Eltif. He'll help you, mm -hmm. you know. And so that's kind of just gradually over time. Um, so it got to a point where really if I had a piece of legislation, people would be like, you know, he's a good guy. Mm -hmm. We may not agree with the legislation, but let's see if we can help him pass it. Right. And um, But the key is is respect, and that's what's so sad to me now in politics is, you know, we don't, we just don't, we lack respect for other people and their opinions and we should be more respectful and you don't need all the name calling. You just need to, you need to res respectfully disagree. Right. I mean, you know, and you just, I, you know, the person comes to mind is Ronald Reagan. I mean, what, and just a class mm -hmm. gentleman mm -hmm. and he, you know, he fought like hell, but, but in a gentleman right. manner. And uh, we don't have that anymore. Right. No, I definitely, there, there's definitely a rise in tribalism yes. to where, and it's like if uh, if I even sit across from a member of yes. the, the anti-my tribe, then, yes. you know, somehow I have, you know, I'm not pure enough. And it's it really is a shame. And, well, let me ask you this. So as you look back on what has been an incredible career to this point, um uh, and, and I know you and I have joked offline about just, you know, being in politics, we can poke fun at ourselves. Right. It's just, it's, it's a bunch of goofballs <laughs> and it's, gosh, why am I doing this? But, but would, would you, would you consider your public service one of the most fulfilling account as you look Absolutely. back on you look at it with fondness? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, honestly, as corny as it sounds, being able to help people when people call you, um, you know, especially as mayor council because it's local mm -hmm. and you know someone calls you and they've got their electricity's been turned off or mm -hmm. there's really a bad something pothole in the street or the, whatever you know I mean uh, it, it, it's very rewarding mm -hmm. I mean it really is and state level you know I think the most calls I ever got um, on the subject matter was mental health so many parents with kids or, or spouses with mental health needs that couldn't get help mm -hmm. You know, and you cut through the red tape for them, and they call you back crying that, you know, they got they got into a, a, a psychiatric ward or something. I mean, that that's pretty rewarding. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it really is. Yeah. You know, so it's, um, I got a lot out of it without question. I got more out of it than I put in it. Put it that way. And I would say the same thing uh, as well. Now, so now public service of a different kind has has found you and. And I gotta tell you, and if Governor Abbott is listening, and, and, and you know, I mean, Kevin, you're a pretty well connected guy. I mean, I would love to be a regent at Stephen F. Austin State University, where I did my undergrad. <laughs> I didn't know until today that um, that we share some SMU DNA, which yeah, is where I got my yeah. MBA. But I'm not nearly hoity-toity enough to ever be a trustee Don't of, start that of SMU. Don't but start SFA, that. I mean, that's my people. That's, <laughs> in, that's behind the piney curtain. So, so Governor Abbott, if you're Bob Garrett, if you're listening, there you go. Uh, you know, I would love to be a region because how cool to be that student that is, you know, a, a, a young undergrad at your university, and now you're not just a regent, but you're the chairman of the Board of Regents of one of the largest university systems in the United States of America. Unbelievable. So tell me kind of, how, I mean, other than just like I said, just because let's face it, and I'm not going to be sophisticated about it, it's cool to, to be the you know, chairman of the Board of Regents of your, of your university. 
how did that happen? And then I want to get into kind of goals for the UT system and just the state of, uh, of higher education today. But kind of take me through that process and how you ended up being the chairman of the Board of Regents for University of Texas. Well, I, you know, as, as all my um, college friends and fraternity brothers would say, I would be the least likely candidate that they would ever suspect it would be on the Board of Regents or the chair if you can go back to the college yeah. days. But, um, you know, after I, I, told, I, I, I told the governor, my last session, I knew I wasn't going to run again. Um, and I think that was 15, if I'm not mistaken. So we're in session, and I told, uh, I was actually helping the governor and lieutenant governor and speaker. We were at a budget impasse, and I was working with both sides trying to put the final budget so we could get out of there without special session. Anyway, I, I made known I wasn't going to run again. And Governor Abbott at the time was saying, no, you need to run again, El Taf. We need, we need you. And I said, Governor, I'm just, I'm not going to do it. Um, I just, I th always feel like when you, you know, if you don't have the passion for any job, it's time to step aside. And I, I you know, it was it was time for new blood. And um, Senator Brian Hughes, who took my place, has done a hell of a job. He's doing a great job. So anyway, it's the right decision. And I always thought too, I want to leave when everybody likes me. So I, I left when you know the building still liked me. You know, I went out I not I hate to say went out on top, but I, I went and I went out at a good time for me. So anyway, he he mentioned you know well maybe. You know, I might need to find something for you to do. I mean, if an appointment of some sort. I didn't think much about it. And then they called. I think I wasn't out of office that long. I think I was out of office. Um, actually, I wasn't out of office because I, my term ran through 15. I think it was a month or two out of office, and they called and asked if I would consider uh, the governor would interested in appointing me to the Board of Regents. And, of course, who wouldn't do that? I was so honored to do it. So I took, you know, obviously did it, got confirmed in the Senate, and I've been there two years. It's a six-year term, mm -hmm. and uh, so I've been there two years, and then in December, I was elected chairman of the board. Okay. So, and, you know, the the number one, it's funny, I haven't really thought about this until you've, you've made me go through this is your life here, mm -hmm. but it's the theme is the same. We put him, <laughs> we, uh, I was asked, to, when I first got on there, a year into being on the Board of Regents, formed the uh, reorganization task force for the UT system, and I chaired it to reorganize and streamline the system, which is really no different than I did at the city of Tyler, um, because we had, the UT system had gone from, I think, 500 employees up to 900 employees. Now, keep in mind the UT system is like a holding company that oversees the 14 institutions. A lot of your listeners may not, because sometimes people think it's the, the flagship or anyway, but so we're... We're the system that basically oversees, you know, MD Anderson, UT Southwestern, UT Tyler, Flagship, and Austin, our 14 institutions. So we just, we kind of, we, we had started a lot of top-down initiatives over the years. Mm -hmm. And once again, we, uh, the new regents, the three new regents that, the two others, Rad Weaver and Janice Longoria, that were appointed with me by Abbott, we really went to say, hey, we need to we need to stop this. It needs to be bottom up. The fourteen institutions are our customers or our children, however you want to look at it, and we should be a streamlined, well operating, well oiled machine at the system level, and operate as efficiently as possible, and just help our fourteen institutions. And so we embarked on this task force to do just that. And I think to date we've eliminated about two hundred jobs. And people, you know, I don't think everybody understands, but every dollar we save at the system goes to the institutions. Mm -hmm. So it's, we're not, you know, this is money that can go into the hands of one of our institutions, primarily UT Austin, because by law, by constitution, that's where most of the money goes. So, you know, we'll be able to up, up the contribution we make at the system level to the flagship by 10 or $20 million a year, which is a lot of money. Right. So that's kind of been the what I've worked on since I've been there. We're still in the middle of op of implementing that. We're not done yet. Okay. And, you know, you bring a good point about the listeners like because there's people that have only been familiar with uh, private universities and a trustee system or yes. whatever the case may be. So describe to the listeners what the Board of Regents is, what the role is, and as the chair, what your authority is and, uh, and what you do uh, as it relates to the Regents and how many there are, Authority, all that kind of very, describe that. Yeah, it's very good because you know, honestly, till I and I was in the Senate, I was in the legislature for many years, and I didn't even know all everything about, never really thought about it. But there are nine uh, 
the University of Texas Board of Regents. There's nine regents, and there's one student regent, so there's ten total. We have a student regent that's appointed by the governor. And not, the nine regents are basically governor appointees. So we're appointed by the governor, all six-year terms. Uh, you have to be confirmed by the Texas Senate. And, and we are the governing board for the entire University of Texas system. And like I said, it, that's, we have 14 institutions. We have MB Anderson, Southwestern. I, I'll, I'll leave one out here in a minute. But mm -hmm. UT Tyler, mm -hmm. Austin, San Antonio. We have Health Science Center in Tyler in San Antonio, Health Science Center in Houston. Mm -hmm. So um, the Rio Grande Valley, Permian Basin. I mean, there are 14 institutions that, have, that fly the UT brand that we oversee. So, you know... We, we are basically the governing body for all those 14 institutions. Okay. And we oversee the Permanent University Fund, which the Permanent Uni University Fund is about a $20 billion, I think, uh, around there endowment that is primarily funded by the uh, Permanent Basin lands that the, uh, that's in the, con the Texas Constitution that we share with A&M system. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty big, it's, a, you know, I, it's about an $18 billion annual organization when you add up all the uh, institutions so uh, it's a you know but we're a governing board right. is what we are we're a board of directors the chair obviously sets the uh, when we meet every about every six weeks we meet the chair is responsible for the agenda for the meetings so the chair sets the agenda and uh, the chair works close with the chancellor mm -hmm. who is uh, hired by the board you know so I'm 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 more of the day-to-day go-between system staff, mm -hmm. you know, on a daily basis, and then I try to keep the, all the regents informed along. The chancellor does that, too. We have a new chancellor, been there six months, J.B. Milliken. He's doing a great job, and we have a great relationship. I mean, we talk a lot, you know, back and forth and keep each other, and he keeps me informed, and if there's stuff I need to go tell the regents, I do, and we make sure, you know, my attitude as the chair is I'm just one of nine like everybody else. Right. You know, so I make sure that the other eight regents and the student regent are fully informed at all times on major stuff. Okay. You know, you know, you you got to remember the nine regents are all volunteers. We're not paid, so everybody's got full time jobs. So um, I do my best to keep them informed without overburdening them on a daily basis. You know, so it's fun. I'm enjoying it, and it's a lot of work, but I, I'm really enjoying it. So, question I have as a parent of one college freshman, uh, Ryland's at the University of Alabama, uh, Abby, my youngest, she's about to go off to uh, uh, CU Boulder, um, just the state of higher education in general. I mean, you know, you hear, you hear all sorts of things, and you know, some of the problem areas I hear is, one, you've got the lack of diversity of thought at the university, that you, whether it's real or perceived there's this perception that you know there's there's it's not it's universities used to be where people could go and think critically and it might be against the grain but it was that was the safest place to hash out ideas of disagreement right. and come to solving problems uh we, we we hear that some of that's going away with political correctness safe spaces call it what you will then you've got the cost Costs are rising, yes. which I think is kind of interesting in that, and especially at the University of Texas. I know you guys are seeing this because, obviously, having children that are of college age, and I know as a state senator, your phone probably rang off the wall constantly because even with all the knocks against universities, American colleges, right. higher education, there are still people beating the doors to get in. So yes. it's harder and harder and more and more expensive to get in. And, but, and then you've got so many occupations in this digital age, this service economy that we have that doesn't necessarily require uh, a university degree. You've got all these factors. That, and what I see happening is you've got a, this, this very, very old, old story mode of learning uh, that is going through in, in, a, in a world, in a 21st century where the world is moving at a breakneck pace. So as a region of, I mean, one of the major university systems in the entire country, what are your thoughts? What's your philosophy for higher education? You're a value guy. I mean, I love to hear you. I mean, I, I, you know, I love to hear and know that a Kevin Eltyfe is the chair of the regents because if there's anybody that I think can bring cost effectiveness and value into what doesn't appear to be a very value-oriented, cost-effective-oriented industry, it's you. So 
how do you approach the UT system? Because it is, I mean, you're, everybody's going to see what UT does. So tell me kind of what your philosophy is on, on those. And I said a lot there. Yeah, so I know. Kind of take- I, okay. All right, so I think from a value standpoint and efficient standpoint, we have to clean up. The system has to clean up itself before we can look to our institutions. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, a lot of people at the system are like, well, why, you know, look at so-and-so, look at, look at the hospital, or look at this, one of this institution. Why aren't, well, they're doing this, why, you know, they're wasting money. Well, I think we lead by example at the system first. So we, we're going to try to get our house in order. We've already eliminated 200 positions, and we'll probably, you know, I don't know where it'll end up, but we're going to go through and make sure I value our employees at the system. They do a fabulous job. This isn't about just cutting to cut, but we have to do what's in the best interest of our institutions. And so we will go through every department. We'll try to streamline if possible. We'll, we'll keep departments. You know, there's a lot of our departments do fabulous work for our institutions that are needed. Some may need more employees. We don't know. So anyway, we're going we're gonna to lean up and operate efficiently at the system level. Once we do that, the next thing we're doing is we're going to bring all of our institutions before the full Board of Regents and ask them to present a three- to five-year financial plan so we can actually see what each institution's plans are for the next three to five years so we can kind of project. You know, if we don't get any new money from the legislature and from the state, who, by the way, are great partners for us, I mean, they, they're, they're not just our partner, they're our boss, but they partners in financially, they're our boss in the other terms. But um, we're going to bring our institutions in and kind of look at their financials in a three to five year snapshot, so we can go back to the capital and say, "All right, you know, here's what UT Tyler looks like. Here's what it looks like three to five years. They're going to have to increase tuition the following amount if we don't get more money from you, which is fine. We're not over here, you know, saying you have to give us more. We're not blaming tuition increases on them or anybody else. We're just saying this is what it looks like. At the same time, we'll look at trying to operate those 14 institutions more efficiently because that money." translates to less tuition for students. So we're going to look at all of that. When you look at, you know, I think what we forget about in the state of Texas, you know, a lot of people beat on the legislature for not giving higher ed enough money. Tuition's gone up. But, you know, I had a son at um, Texas, and I had a son at TCU for a while. And if people (laughs) will just look at the difference in tuition for non-state-funded schools, you'll see how important the state's contribution is, you know, I think, I think Texas was, I may not get this exactly right, I think I was like 4000 a semester, I think that sounds right, and TCU was like 17000 a semester, so, and, and that's because they don't have state funds, so, you know, the state schools in Texas are, uh, are so appreciative, or UT system is so appreciative of the legislature for what they give us, because it does keep tuition very low. Now, could it be lower? I don't know. Can we try to contain increases? We're going to do our best. But it's it's a real act, you know, it's work and it's an effort, but it needs to be done. We have to do everything we can. Look, I'm a product of a single parent home who went to school on Social Security benefits. Mm-hmm. So I, I get that $4,000 is a lot of money for uh, low income families to get their kids through school. but. The other part, there are a lot of grants, Pew grants and things, but we've got to do everything in our power in Texas to make it, to make it affordable and accessible to every student in Texas. It's, it's critical for the future of the state. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, I, you know, I'm a UT system guy. I'm all about University of Texas, but I'm equally, I equally care about A&M and Houston and Tech and all of our schools. I mean, because uh, all of our public... Uh, State schools are important. I want all of us to work together because it's important. I mean, I don't care where the student's going in Texas. We want them to to succeed. We want them to be able to afford it and and, because that's what's going to make Texas to continue to grow and be a prosperous state. Yeah, I mean, and that, you know, one of, you know, I was the first member of my family to graduate from college. And same thing, I, I started out on a football scholarship because it's the only way I was going to get there and uh, ended up giving that up and another thing was sharing in common. I drove a bobtail truck. There you, know, you go. So we, I got the Class C CDL. I think the Class B would allow us to drive the big rigs, but so I, did, I didn't step up to the big rig either. And as a matter of fact, I literally, this last <laughs> renewal, I kept mine. Uh, because you have to go in to renew your commercial driver's license. You have to go to the EPS. You can't renew online. 
And I would still go down there because I'm like, you know what? No matter how bad it gets, I can always go drive my That's drive a bobtail, right? Exactly yeah, right. I, I could do it, but I finally gave up my Class C CDL, and it was almost like a badge of honor, too. But uh, but so I have that perspective, and that's one of the things I, I worry about is these 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 students that come out, and it's just I'm not saying everybody needs to go to college, you right? Know? Especially right. again, going back to the, in this day and age, it's really um, I think the competition is going to be. Not it, you guys. Uh, I mean, I say you guys as you being a leader in a university system. The competition now isn't just are they going to go to the or to UT or Arkansas or Tech, but it's going to be do I go to UT, Arkansas, Tech, or do I go at all? Do yeah, I go find? Right. Do I go find a Kevin Eltyth and say, Mister Eltyth, can I apprentice with you? learn the real estate business, learn what you've done, learn how to write a business plan, execute, how to do financial modeling, learn it like a great example of someone in Austin, Ryan Holiday, who was the probably the youngest, I think he was the youngest CMO of any Fortune 500 company ever. And he, I believe he started out at Stanford, I may have that right, and if God willing, Ryan Holiday ever listens to my <laughs> podcast and wants to come on and be interviewed to correct that, that'd be fine. But he went to Robert Greene and was an apprentice. Right. You know, I think there's more and more of that. So That's right. there's a whole other element of competition, I think, for universities given the state rent. And with that being the case, as a brand, what is what what is your hope that if I'm in if I'm in Spokane, Washington, I'm in Manhattan, I'm in Kansas, and I and I'm a kid like like my girls. They're looking at the whole country. You know, one ends up in Tuscaloosa, the other the other ends up in Boulder. What do you want the UT brand to represent for that kid that's going, I may not even go. If I do go, I'm going to a public institution. What, 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 what do you want UT to be known? You know, I, I want us to be known as a quality education at an affordable price that's easy for the kids to traverse as they go through, you know, mm -hmm. as you know just go through their campus life experience mm -hmm. because some places even some of our own institutions that we have to work on are so difficult you know do you have enough counselors do they even know they get to the end and they don't know if the, you know is there are the community college hours going to transfer that's always a problem are their high school dual credits going to transfer i mean that's still a work in progress at all schools mm -hmm. so what i i'd like for us to be one of the more user-friendly uh institutions Around and that, that's going to take a lot of work, mm -hmm. and you know our our academic institutions need to all find their own niche. Mm -hmm. You know we have a, a tremendous flagship University of Texas Austin, but you know UT Tyler is not UT Austin, and Tyler needs to find its niche, and they're all doing that right now. And we need to promote our different campuses for what their niche is going to be in serving the, the students of Texas and the nation. I mean that's. That's what we want to do. But I, I want it to be as user-friendly as possible because it's a very daunting task. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can tell you that I've had a kid at... Uh, my oldest son went to TCU for a while, then he graduated from Tech, and my youngest, Jack, went to UT. And I'm just telling you, there's a huge difference between all three schools. Really? And uh, Tech, by far, is the more user-friendly. Really? Yeah. I mean, their, their website... <clears throat> I mean, they, they just they've done a great job with it. So I mean, and that make, that makes a difference to these right. kids, I think, right? Um, and to parents, I agree. And and just to to make a plug, you know, uh, UT Tyler, what a yes. gem, yes, right here in the unofficial capital of East Texas. And and what's really cool to see about UT Tyler is that you know, back probably when back when I was in school, it was more of the 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 university system universities that, that were away from the mothership. Right. That's where you went until you went Correct. to the mothership. Correct. Now, UT Tyler has become yes. a four-year destination university. Yes. And uh, That's correct. it's really impressive. And we need to take all of our institutions at the University of Texas system, and they need to find their niche and what they want to be known for and what style of campus they want, and we need to, let, and we need to help promote them in that manner. Because they all have a special place. Right. And you're right. People that, most of your listeners probably have never seen the University of Texas at Tyler. It, it's an incredible campus. Yeah. It's, it's 
one of the fastest growing institutions. I mean, it, it's a nice little, like, it's a hidden secret, like uh, I said. Mo- most definitely. All right, so we are now at the hour point. Can you believe that you and I have sat down I and know, talked for an hour? Believe. Neither one of us cussed. I know it. We I didn't know. offend anybody, <laughs> I don't think. Um, and so here's my, here are my takeaways from sitting down right. for an hour with Kevin L. Tithe. Um, as, re- as regards leadership, build relationships. Yes. Get to know the people that you're going to have to at some point uh, ask a favor or convince to come your way. Learn. Yes. So relationships. Treat everyone with respect. Yes. When it comes to buying a piece of property, a business, whatever, manage your risk. Understand your exit strategy. Make sure you're going to be able to cover the notes. So, in other words, plan for the doomsday scenario. Yes. And mailbox money and no employees <laughs> is, a, is a good thing. It's not bad. All right. All right. So, is there anything else either to the UT community, the East Texas community, anyone at large that we've missed? Well, the only thing I'll say, just you know, just to make sure we cover all bases, and it is Mother's Day weekend coming up. Uh-huh. That I've been married for um, 33 years to Kelly, and we have two boys, Jack and Walker. Wow. And I'm very proud of these, the, my two sons. They're good boys. And, um, you and know, Kelly family, makes you look really good. Well, I know she does. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> family always comes first. I, yeah. I always like to say, you know, it's my faith and my family are the two most important things in my life. The rest is just window dressing. I mean, that's that's the real. You got to take care of those bases first. Right. Well, state of Texas, there is my favorite former state senator and folks in UT land. There is the new chairman of your Board of Regents. I I can tell you from everything I know, the system is in incredibly good hands with the the Board of Regents uh, under under, uh, Senator L. Tosh's leadership, I think will do great things. Kevin, brother, thank you so much for being a friend, a mentor. Thank you for sitting down and doing this. And folks, thank you for listening. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much for listening to the Texas Titans podcast. I want to remind you that you can read my blog, Make Your Own Rules, at jasonrightnow.com. I would be so grateful if you would go to jasonrightnow.com, check it out, and there, just by registering, you can download a free copy of my first book, Push play, taking your life off pause. Please, please, please do that. That's jasonrightnow.com. For show notes, go to texttitans.blog. You can find out everything about our guests, some of the things that we talked about, Some, uh, if I mentioned some uh, books or something like that. That's where I'm going to place all the show notes. It's texttitans.blog, so be sure and check that out. And also, I wanted to do a plug for the Tyler Innovation Pipeline. Are you an entrepreneur? Are you a maker? Are you an inventor? You have got to check out this incredible resource that is available at such an economic price for all sorts of makers. It's located at 217 East Oakwood Street in Tyler, Texas. Please go check it out or go to tylerinnovators.com. Read up on it. If you want to take a tour of it, whatever you want to do, contact uh, the folks there at the tip as we call it, the Tyler Innovation Pipeline, you will be blown away. As a member, you could have use of a full recording studio complete with green screen. This thing is state-of-the-art and will blow your mind. Do you want to have your own podcast? Do you want to be a podcaster? There is a podcast studio at the Tyler Innovation Pipeline, but not only that, there are classes held on how to do these things, how to create digital content, how to create your own podcast, how to do video editing, how to use a miter saw, how to do 3D printing. There are so many things that are available to you at the Tyler Innovation Pipeline, so I encourage you, please, please check it out. And those of you who are successful in as entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and inventors, and if you've made it, we need your support. So please, by all means, consider supporting the Tyler Innovation Pipeline. We would be so grateful if you did. Thanks so much.